Uh, thank you guys so much. We are so pleased to be with you here today. Thank you, Jill and Tandra. Of course, thanks to the amazing KCLS, King County Library System, such a bedrock in the uh, community up there in Seattle and greater Seattle, especially to uh, job seekers. So my name is Tim Workman. I am the community outreach associate with an organization called Upwardly Global. Uh, and today I am presenting with my colleague, Layla. And Layla, you can go ahead and introduce yourself. Tim. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Layla Davini, and I'm, as Tim said, with Upwardly Global. I work as a job advisor, and I've been with Upglo for five years. Um, and one of the most important things that I work um, on with Upwardly Global candidates are resumes. So very happy to be with you all here today to talk about resumes. Indeed. So we're only going to take about an hour of your time today for our lecture. So as Layla mentioned, and as you hopefully know, we will be reviewing resumes, which are so, so important to your job search. And hopefully this is a good refresher for most of you. Um, so if we can go to the uh, table of contents slide, I believe is the next slide. So we're going to be covering, first I'm going to introduce our organization. I'm just going to give you some good context on resumes, some basic tips that uh, you should all be incorporating into your resumes. Um, and then we're going to go section by section. So we can't cover every conceivable resume section, but we will be talking about the really strong basic sections that you should be including or thinking of including in your resume and giving you some tips. Um, importantly, Layla uh, luckily is an expert. Uh, she helps, she assists job seekers day in and day out with their resumes. So if you have any specific questions at the end about your particular situation or your resume, feel free to put them in the chat box. We'll try to address all of them uh, as we can. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our organization to you. So. Uh, we can move to the next slide. So Upwardly Global is the first and only nonprofit of its kind in the United States that focuses specifically on immigrant and refugee professional job seekers. We help this population because they struggle especially to get back into their career fields in the United States very frequently they are working in jobs like Uber, Lyft, Instacart. They're working at the restaurant. They're working at other, what we call transitional jobs, unable to bust out of those jobs and put their skills to work in the professional job market. For example, we have a lot of doctors, uh, people who are trained as doctors in their home countries, business professionals, teachers, scientists. It runs the gamut. We work in four major employment markets across the United States. That includes the San Francisco Bay Area, Chicago, New York City, Washington, DC. And we have what we call satellite markets, which includes our uh, King County program as well, which is another major job market with a lot of immigrants. So we are placing 1,000 people per year in full-time professional jobs. Even though the economy has slowed down a little bit, our placement of job seekers has not really slowed down. So we are still helping people find full-time professional work. In the Bay Area, that's less relevant to you guys. In Seattle, I can give you that number off the top of my head. We're talking an average annual salary of $54,000 per year. So that's just an average. Obviously, it goes much higher in some instances. Again, we work with some very highly trained and skilled professionals. I want to point out to you that our program is 100% free. We are a nonprofit organization. We take our funding from charitable foundations, as well as state and city governments for the most part. So if you are interested in our program, or you know somebody who might be interested in our program, I encourage you to 
write down that link upwardlyglobal.org forward slash programs, uh, share it widely, visit our webpage to learn more. Um, okay, so that's it about us. Let's move directly into, oh, that's not it about us. So another thing that I wanted to let you guys know about, we do have, so if you're like, I'm not an immigrant, I, this, this doesn't apply to me. We do have stuff that's available to the public that you might find useful. One example is this. We have a public portal with some short courses on it. You can learn about the US job search if you are an immigrant and you just don't want to do our full, full program or English language professional communication, but more pertinent for the public at large, you can learn how to master the phone interview. Virtual interviews are really important right now. And importantly, a great nugget of information, how to update and improve your LinkedIn profile, which is so important right now, especially as everything is online during the pandemic. Okay, so let's move into our first resume slide. I feel like it's kind of fun just to give you a little bit of historical context. So that's just what I'm gonna do briefly here. So what is a resume? I think we can understand it a little bit better if we put it into its history. Believe it or not, this is really interesting. Leonardo da Vinci invented the resume. Uh, I don't really know if this is super true, but I, I, saw, I saw a reference to this all over online. Um, so he originally wrote to the Duke of Milan about how he was the man for the job when it came to creating weapons of war for the Duke's army or making statues and paintings of the Duke's family. So I guess he was really the first guy or the first recorded instance of somebody just bragging, laying out all of their skills on paper and saying, this is why you should hire me. This is why you should give me the purse. I don't think he actually got the job, which is kind of interesting when you think about it. it. It kind of reflects the struggle of all job seekers, right? When we're sending our resume out in the world, trying to say, hire me. Um, so between 1482 and the mid 20th century, I can't really give you a lot of information about what happened with the resumes. I have no idea. I'm sure there's a history there. I'm sure nobody really cares but more pertinent to us in, in the United States by the mid 20th century. So we're talking the 1950s, resumes really became expected, right? So they started to standardize. We started to, employers started to say, hey, I'm gonna need this information before I even consider hiring you. In the early 20th century, that wasn't necessarily always the case. This is interesting because in the 1950s and maybe a little bit earlier than that, resumes would include information like your weight, your age, your height, your marital status, things like that, right? Those are things that we consider very taboo in the United States nowadays. We don't include that on our resume. Some countries might actually still include that kind of information on their resumes. Uh, but we don't do it here because what happened in the 1960s and 1970s is we start seeing civil rights legislation coming around and then we start seeing personnel departments all over the United States really tackle this uh, sort of anti-discrimination thing. So we're not going to include things like your marital status, whether you have children, things like that. So by the time we get to the digital age with Microsoft, we really start to see the standardization of the resume across uh, most industries. And so we arrive where we are at today, which Layla will tell us about. Thanks, Tim. Yeah, and another big one is uh, photos. I've seen a lot of photos on resumes um, with candidates I work with, but in the US, that's not something that, um, that we do. Let's talk about resumes today. So resumes, and we'll talk about different resume formats later uh, on, but they really highlight your skills and experience while leaving out a considerable portion of the about you. Um, so the resumes you can think of are the what and the when. 
So really, employers are looking to find someone who has the ability to do the job. And your resume is showing them that this is the proof that I have those abilities, that experience, that education. It doesn't necessarily mean that we don't focus on the who of marketing yourself. And that's where social media and uh, the professional networking site, for example, LinkedIn comes in. Um, these are all kind of supplements, Facebook, Squarespace, online portfolios, blogs, where you can add images, media, links to the, your university, research publications, and the like. Um, some people say, are saying that resumes are going extinct, but that's really not the case. And they remain super relevant in the job search today. Absolutely. Um, so some common resume formats, just to give you some basic formats that you might have already encountered in the world or that you will encounter or that you will hear about online when you're trying to create your actual resumes. Um, here they are. So by far the most common is going to be the chronological format. So this lists your job titles, the names of your company, the dates, some of your measurable achievements or tasks that you did at that job. So this type of resume is very standard and it's going to be typically ideal for people that have a steady employment history. You don't really have a ton of gaps in your employment history. Or if you're seeking a role that is consistent with your work history. So the next type of resume is what they call a functional resume. This is not typically as common or as favored by hiring managers. Uh, this basically discusses your skills by functional categories. So this is not going to include dates, which for some people, they like that. So people who have a highly varied work experience, maybe you have some lapses in your employment, you took some gap years, you went and traveled, or maybe, I don't know, maybe you, you, you just didn't have a steady employment history for whatever reason. For some of our clients, it might be because they were in complicated immigration situations. Um, but so that's the story on that. It's not really specific about time, okay? It's very specific about your skills and the functional categories of your skills. Um, so the next is going to be a hybrid of the two. And this is actually the one that we want everyone to use. Uh, people who come into our program in particular, this is going to combine both a chronological work history and then it's going to discuss, it's going to highlight your skills up front. Okay, so this is ideal, for example, for people who, uh, I think for everybody, but for per particularly for people who have a steady work history, you're looking for maybe a, a career change. Um, and this is truly like a favorite of hiring managers. It's very good. It's highly customizable as well. We'll talk about resume customization as we go along. Thanks, Tim. So what are some elements of a great resume? So before we kind of go into the details here, just keep in mind a recruiter tends to spend five to seven seconds scanning through a resume. And so the ultimate goal and one that kind of defines a great resume is that a recruiter will be able to scan through it in a very short um, amount of time and green light your resume to move to the next kind of round or to be selected for an interview. And that's why the first point that we wanna stress is simplicity, minimalism, and relevancy. So you really want your resume to have white space, readable font, bullet points, pared down language. If you can use one word, for example, instead of five, you want to do that. Your resume should only be one page long, but two maximum, and that's still okay. So it's really important to be as concise as possible. Um, avoid any kind of colors or fancy graphics, unless you're a graphic designer, in which case your resume is, you know, a way to kind of display your design skills. So that's okay. Um, but also use 
standard resume headings like work experience. Don't do anything too out of the box. So you don't wanna say something like where I've been as a heading. Um, and also keep in mind, use both long form and acronyms where possible. So for example, instead of just writing SEO, you wanna write out search engine optimization and also put SEO in parentheses next to that or master of business administration. You wanna write that out and then also put MBA in parentheses next to that to avoid confusing the applicant tracking system, which we'll talk more about um, a few slides down. So likewise, we also want to use keywords and key phrases. You'll be customizing your resume for every job application to include the keywords and the phrases, which are specific abilities, skills, expertise, and traits that recruiters and hiring managers are looking for in a candidate. So we find out what these keywords and phrases are by carefully reading through the job description. I also like to kind of just highlight all the different phrases in the job description before working on a job application, which is really helpful. These keywords are what recruiters are scanning for when they first look at your resume. So to do this effectively, it's very important to read through, familiarize yourself with the job posting for the position that you're applying for. And it's really just your key to knowing what the hiring managers and recruiters are looking for in a candidate, the education, experience, skills, um, and the like. Um, the third one is measurable. So we want measurable success to be very apparent on your resume. You want the size and the scope of your achievements to be apparent. It's easier for people to understand the, your contributions in that position that way. So for example, don't say, I did a lot of sales calls. Um, instead, you want to make that very specific. So did you increase sales? You know, Think, by how much did you increase sales? Um, and you can do this by always thinking of the PAR structure, which stands for problem or project, action and result. So a strong point would be, for example, instead of I did, I did a lot of sales calls, a strong point would be successfully built the platform from 25 million unique users to 60 million unique users by onboarding partners. And lastly, you want to always think action-packed. Act, use action words, resume adjectives to give your achievements and your tasks movement and descriptive depth in a very short space. So avoid any passive um, constructions and this improves the length and readability. One thing you should always note is on your US you know, resume, um, never use personal pronouns. It's just a weird rule um, for the resume. Just never use personal pronouns. So those are I, me, my, um, any of those kinds of words should not be used on your resume. Definitely rules to live by um, when it comes to writing your resume. So. When we think of the resume, it's not just a static document. So you will be, of course, adding to your resume over time as you gain skills, but you will also be customizing your resume every time you apply to a new job. Uh, so basically, why do we customize? There's lots of different reasons. Um, this gives resume customization basically gives recruiters or hiring managers a, a simple roadmap, uh, roadmap showing where you acquired and developed all of the skills they are looking for in a candidate for that position. So you're customizing towards the role. Um, so how do we do that? So we do this by actually incorporating the terminology of the job description into our resume. This means we put the job title in 
the job title of the role that we're applying for in our summary if we don't have the same job title that we're going for in our professional experience. We incorporate hard skills keywords wherever appropriate. Okay, so one little word of advice that we give our job seekers is you want to pay attention to the skills that they name up front in the job description. So these are usually more crucial to the role. Uh, and if you acquired, developed, used these skills in previous positions, even if they weren't primary to the role, you still want to include them as the first bullet point or you want to put them up front, okay? Um, and then of course, within the resume, the body of the resume itself, you want to make sure that you're contextualizing those skills, how and why you use those particular skills in past positions. All right, so this is really easier said than done. Um, there is this website called JobScan. I included this little graphic down here, this little link. Uh, we really recommend that people use this service. It's, it's a free service, as far as I know, it's still free. And they will actually go through your resume. They won't, their software will. And they will tell you how well it's matching to the job description of the job that you are applying for. So this is a very useful tool if you're playing around with customizing your resume and you want to see ultimately how well your resume matches. This isn't just putting your faith in software to tell you if your resume matches in the eyes of a recruiter. It is actually an ATS algorithm, okay? It's a publicly available ATS algorithm. What is ATS? That's an applicant tracking system. Most major employers use ATF, so, uh, sorry, ATS software to determine if a particular resume is a good match for the role before a recruiter or an HR person will even look at your resume. So that's in part why we customize the resume. And Layla will tell you a little bit more in depth about ATS systems. So um, as Tim was saying, um, ATS software, applicant tracking systems, um, they really take these keywords and phrases and from the job description and scan through the resume or cover letter to see how much of a match uh, that candidate is. And so that's something that you have to take into account as a candidate. Um, as Tim mentioned, just think of ATS software as a resume sorting software. So it's a program that reads through hundreds, thousands of resumes and ranks them according to the best, from best to uh, worst match for that job. Um, and here are some quick kind of numbers for you to take into account just to see how important this is and widely used. 98% of Fortune 500 companies use applicant tracking systems, 66% of large companies, and 35% of small organizations. So it's a very common thing. Um, even websites like Indeed and LinkedIn have their own ATS systems. Some recruiters may scan all resumes uh, in their ATS feed, just to make sure that ATS didn't miss anything or mess something up, but you should not count on this. You should assume that your resume is going to pass through the ATS system. And here are a few ways that you can pass that ATS system and move beyond that to the point where you can land an interview and you know, positively kind of get green lighted through ATS. So as Tim was just discussing, customizing your resume is extremely important. So just keep in mind, you know, you start out with a foundation resume. That's what, we, what I like to call it, a foundation resume. And from there, you take that resume copy and customize it for every single um, job that you apply for. So using the keywords and phrases from that job description, you want to make sure you're incorporating them very similarly to the way that they've used those phrases um, in your resume. And the second way is spell it out. So as we were discussing earlier, 
um, rather than just using acronyms like MBA, you want to make sure to spell out Master of Business Administration and also put MBA in the parentheses or search engine optimization SEO. And this will help ATS software recognize it. If the job posting, for example, has SEO, uh, but they don't have search engine optimization phrased on, that way on the job posting, and you've only said written out search engine optimization, it may not catch that. So just remember, always use both ways to be on the safe side. Uh, the third is simplicity. So in the context of ATS, the same rules apply. Use standard fonts, standard headings, avoid headers and footers, colors, tables, columns. These can all kind of make ATS go haywire and cause for that text to not be read. Um, so I've seen a lot of resumes that come to me in graphs or charts. I would recommend avoiding that and just typing it out without using the graphs or charts. You know, if columns are okay, but you wanna avoid um, anything otherwise. And lastly, make sure to save and submit your job application documents, resume cover letter as a document or PDF uh, in those formats, because many ATS systems cannot read other files. So just remember, always stick to the document or the PDF format. Absolutely. Thank you, Layla. Uh, remember, if you have any specific questions about any of this, you can type it into the chat box and we'll try to get to it at the end. Um, so what are some common mistakes, mistakes that we see all the time, mistakes that we ourselves have committed on resumes, the cardinal sins of resumes, things that you definitely need to look out for? Well, the first one, it's bad grammar. So we really want to make sure that we are proofreading a lot. Your eyes can get tired. You want to make sure that you have friends also proofread your resume. It's always good to get fresh eyes on the scene. Um, we don't want spelling errors. We want to make sure that we don't have missing words. It can make your resume lose its flow, right? Flow is really important on your resume, let me just say, because the hiring manager that is reading your resume or recruiter is reading possibly hundreds of resumes. So it can get very annoying if they have to, con their brain is constantly getting jammed up on incorrect things on your resume. Okay, it really, it really affects their confidence. So if you don't want to say, led a team engineers. You wanna say led a team of four engineers, right? Keep it grammatical, keep it specific. You wanna use consistent tenses. This is a tough one, especially for people who um, are learning English as a second language sometimes. English tenses can be very complicated. So we say, just keep it as simple as possible. Use simple present tense for your current job or position simple past tense for your past role, okay? Don't use passive language. I'm not an English teacher. I can't really give you a good summary on what a passive verb tense is. It's something like 35% revenue growth was realized. We don't wanna phrase things that way. We wanna say achieved 35% revenue growth over three years, okay? We want to use an active verb formulation. We also, as Layla uh, said before, just to emphasize, omit personal pronouns. Okay, we don't do that on resumes. That's also good for brevity because we don't want it to be long. Um, so one thing, if you're a non-native speaker of English, just make sure you are having a native speaker look over it for you before you submit it. That's just to ensure, even if you're very confident in your English, we just wanna make sure that you're not making any tiny mistakes, right? Um, another thing is no contact information. You would be surprised. 
you would be surprised. Uh, some people will submit their resume and it doesn't even, it doesn't even have any way to reach back out to them or that info is dated because they're just copy pasting from an old resume or something. Don't do that. It can be fatal to your job prospects. I mean, I remember, you know, fresh out of college sending a resume. I hadn't updated my contact information, but I didn't know that unbeknownst to me. And by the time I realized it was much too late, never got a call back, right? So don't do that if you can help it. Um, disorganized. That's another big one. So resume organization should generally follow a reverse chronology, okay? So we're starting with the most recent things first, moving to the older things. Make sure that you follow this standard organization. Bulleted achievements. So when we're talking about the things that you're bulleting in your job description, we'll talk about that in a second. There's a specific order. And generally, we're going from most important to least important, okay? So make sure you have that standard organization and logic and flow. Long, right? All right, so remember, you don't want your resume to be too long. This is common for a lot of our clients who come from countries that have, that use CVs and they don't use resumes, for example. Sometimes they'll have 10 pages. So we know you have a lot of, you know, a lot of achievements, a lot of things that you can talk about, but we really want to keep it crystal clear, keep it relevant, and keep it short, unless you're a CEO. If you are a CEO, then the world is your oyster. You probably have a CV as long as a book, and that's fine. Um, okay, so that's it on that. So we're going to move into some quick notes on formatting. Thanks, Tim. For formatting, here's a what the resume should look like. This is a very clean, simple, uh, basic resume format. This is the format that we use at Upwardly Global. You may look at it and it can look potentially boring, but boring is much better than loud and confusing. Um, you want the recruiter to be able to look at it and very easily and quickly be able to scan through and this type of basic format will give you that. So a few things to note, margins. You wanna keep it generally at a one inch margin all around. Don't go bigger than 1.5 though. Um, it's really important to include white space. So a space between key skills and experience or summarying key skills. That makes it much easier for anyone who's looking at your resume to reduce that eye fatigue and still retain white space on the resume. You also want to choose an easy to read font. There are some fonts that are considered kind of standard, like Calibri, Times New Roman, Garamond. Um, do, do not use any non-standard or intricate fonts, even for headings. You want to keep everything consistent. And my recommendation is to keep the same font throughout the entire resume rather than you know, mixing fonts together. It's just easier on the eyes, easier to read. Um, font size. So you can start out at a 10 point font. If possible though, if space allows, I recommend um, 11. You could even do 10.5, 12. You generally wanna keep it to 10 to 12 and, and that's, the rule to remember. And for the subsections, titles, organizations you worked for, you can bold those to make them stand out. It helps the recruiter easily identify key information. So again, this is the resume format that we use at Upwardly Global. And it's very easy to see um, where the sections start and, and where the sections are because they're in bold and we like to also underline um, and capitalize the section titles as well to make them stand out. So it's very easy to see where one section starts and the other ends. We also recommend using bullet points where possible. So bullet points for key skills, bullet points for the professional experience. And in that professional experience section, keeping it Two, two to three sentence maximum 
um, one is the best. And as Tim was saying, um, I always, you know, recommend as well, have someone read over it. You want to have that fresh perspective of someone looking um, over your resume and catching any errors or saying, you know, this isn't very clear. It's maybe not easy to read. Um, so that's, that is really important. And now we're gonna go into talking about each of the specific um, sections. So I'll hand it over to Tim. Yeah, so thanks Layla. Um, so we're just gonna do a quick dive into each section, talk about some tips and tricks and best practices for each one. Uh, this is not exhaustive. There are other types of resume sections that you can include, but these are some of the major ones. And I just wanna add, just for the sake of our own credibility, we have developed this resume format over the course of 20 years of doing this. We get a lot of compliments from HR, from recruiters. Uh, feel free to cop any of this, steal any of this, incorporate it into your resume. It truly is a great resume format. So contact info. I know I was harping on this and I can, I'm gonna harp on it again. Make sure this is up to date make sure it's up to date if nothing else, okay? Uh, triple check everything. Make sure that the spelling of your name, make sure the spelling of your name is consistent across your cover letter, your resume, also your online presence. This is a challenge that some of our clients have in particular because they come from languages that have to be transliterated into our alphabet. So it's not always clear how you spell your name. I mean, spell your name how you want to spell your name. Just make sure that it's consistent across all of your things that the, that the hiring manager is going to see and to search for. I can't tell you how frustrating it is. For example, if I get a resume in our system and I'm trying to find this person's LinkedIn account online and I can't, right? I can't because it doesn't match with the resume that could be fatal to your job prospects, right? So we don't wanna do that. Um, some other points to make here, you should put your LinkedIn in your header, uh, put your email, of course, make sure that your email is not snarky or unprofessional, okay? We don't wanna put cuddlebear32 at Gmail, right? If we're going to be applying to professional position, we wanna make sure that it is a professional sounding email address. The same goes for your LinkedIn. LinkedIn is gonna give you a link to your page that's really long and nasty and ugly looking. You can actually go into your profile settings and truncate that, shorten it and change it to just your name. Or if your name is already taken, it can be like, say my name, like. Tim W1234 or something like that, right? So we're just getting it, we're shortening it, making it look a little bit better so we can include it here. You can also link to your portfolio and your blog. I really recommend this for creative professionals. Just have it right up front. This is key for uh, our immigrant job seekers. If it's appropriate, it's not always appropriate, but if it's appropriate, put your work authorization put that you are fully work authorized. If you're not fully work authorized, don't put it, okay? If you have, you know, conditional, whatever, whatever your situation is. If you're fully work authorized, put it up front. Say no visa or sponsorship required. And of course, optionally, it's always good to let the person who's reading your resume know that you are open to relocation. So you can feel free to put that in there as well. So moving on to the professional summary, um, your professional summary you can think of as TLDR. And if you're not familiar with that term, it's a common internet, internet acronym that stands for too long didn't read. So think of your professional summary as a short summary um, of something that you could spend, you know, a few paragraphs describing, but you need it to be super short. I recommend to all of the candidates I work with, no longer than two to three lines. So two, basically one to two sentences. And I also recommend not including your soft skills. So soft skills are communication, hard worker, team player. This professional summary 
should be focused on your hard skills. So number of years of experience. If there's a degree or you know high school GED that's required, um, they list that's required. You can also put that in the summary. Um, your areas of focus within your professional experience. So in this case, you can see communications professional with extensive experience in outreach, advocacy, teaching and training, PR and event management. So highlighting those core kind of areas of expertise within the profession. So um, a good summary, good way of seeing this is flex your acquired skills. So example, currently enhancing my web development skills as a trainee with the name of the training or recently designed and developed a web app, or you can also write within the summary, seeking an opportunity to build marketing and sales skills with a, and then a type of specific type of company, um, which kind of helps the recruiter understand why you're applying for that job in particular. So you can frame your circumstances if you're going through a period of unemployment in a way that emphasizes that you're still the right person for the job by using the, this type of phrasing and highlighting what you've been up to in the meantime. And we'll talk more about um, tips for dealing with periods of unemployment on the resume um, and down the line in a few slides as well. All right, yeah, so we talked about the fact that the resume that we recommend is a blend between the uh, functional where you're just looking at your skills and then the chronological, right? So this is really the functional part. This is where you're listing your skills. Just like your summary, it's right up front, right? TLDR, recruiter might look at your resume and be like, I ain't reading all that. They're gonna look at your professional summary. They're gonna look at your key skills first thing, all right? So you wanna make sure this is really good. Key skills are going to be the top four to seven skills that make you a great fit for this particular role. So this is also a heavily customized section, right? Just like a lot of the resume, but particularly this. What, I, what you might consider doing when you look at the job description and you're highlighting those skills, right? You wanna go through and highlight the hard skills and the soft skills that, that they're mentioning in the job description go from top to bottom, go from the most important skills for that position. And then, you know, when you move down the document, they're gonna get maybe more like ancillary skills, less important skills, right? Prioritize those top skills, put them right up front, the, the number one bullet, right? Prioritize those top skills. You're always, after that, you're gonna want to include the computer skills that you have that are related to the job description always, okay? Um, and if you have language skills, always just throw them in at the bottom. Some of our clients, they speak like five languages. That's amazing. Uh, make sure you're including it in your skills because that is definitely a hard one skill that you have. Um, so really, I mean, in summary, just really ask yourself, what are the key skills that are needed for this position? Just intuit that and make sure that you're mapping your own skills onto those and, and bringing them forward in this section. Great, and for the professional experience section, I would consider this to be the most important part of your resume. It really demonstrates you can do the job, you're a good fit based off of your past experience. So if your experience, just a quick note, was um, with a company that's based outside of the US. You can see here on the example that Uplo recommends providing you know, a brief description underneath that company. Um, anything that's impressive about the size, significant clients, partners, major international or national kind of presence, US branches. So that's just a quick note for anyone who's held jobs outside of the US. Um, and moving on from that, the bullet points that fall underneath. So these are really essential. Um, as we discussed earlier, they have to be 
very kind of um, specific and, and quantify in order to bring out your accomplishments. They shouldn't just be a plain list of responsibilities. These are your accomplishments. And bringing in those numbers and timeframes and percentages will really help you demonstrate in a very clear way what your accomplishments are. Um, it really gives the potential employer a chance to look at your resume and understand what the scope of your responsibilities were and what the impact of your work, kind of what it had on the company. So to formulate these points, um, I like to do this exercise with candidates on the resume. Ask yourself, what did you do daily if you're struggling to come up with points? So think, what did you do daily? Can you quantify those processes? So how many clients did you interact with per day? If you worked on a project, what was the budget? What, what was the time frame of the project? So just kind of ask yourself these, these types of questions. And just think action verbs. You know, each point needs to start with an action verb. Um, you can find some great lists online or through some of the free Upglow resources we'll talk more about later on. Um, what did you accomplish? You know, think what did you achieve and just really break it down. Um, what systems did you use, numbers, bottom line? Um, and so that's why I also recommend if you're in a job right now, write these things down um, while you're in, in a job, even if you're not looking in the future. Always keep this in mind so you don't forget, but really try to think back on this one and add in all those specifics. And in terms of the number of bullet points, um, there's no rule of thumb. You want to kind of keep it simple. If you're in the position a very short period of time, doing just you know a couple is fine. If you were in that position longer period of time, you want to have kind of more bullet points. Um, so it really just depends. But the biggest uh, kind of thing you should be focusing on is making your bullet points stellar and really quantifying to show your impact and, and achievements. Excellent. So this is your additional experience section. Okay, this is optional, right? Um, you might want to omit this if, if you're professional experience is a little bit long or if you're running out of space, right? But this is a good place to really highlight what we call transitional jobs. So jobs that you have been working in the meantime while you are out sort of out of the, maybe the professional job market um, or volunteer positions. This is where you can highlight volunteer positions. The reason we would include a section like this is because we want to avoid red flags about employment gaps. So if there is a significant gap, like maybe more than a, a year or two um, in your employment, the HR person or the recruiter, they might say, why is that? Uh, so you're gonna answer, why is that? Well, I've actually been doing this, right? Or so I'm, I'm staying current in my skills this way or what have you, okay? Um, so limit these to a few bullet points, especially if they're not relevant to the position. Um, you know, if you're if you're in the midst of a big employment gap right now, you're out of work, and you've been out of work for a while. Uh, you know, again, consider volunteering. I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but you can also do freelance work on Upwork, Fiverr, places like that, just so you can um, you can make sure that you're filling in the holes for the recruiter. You want to you want to show a constant, more or less, engagement and work history. Um, and if you can't, we also have a section that that can help you overcome that hurdle as well. Great. So for the education section, it's pretty straightforward, but there are kind of little additional details you can add. So for education, you want to list out any degrees, just make sure um, you have listed it out by spelling it out in the log form, also included the acronym. So in this case, you see Master of Arts and then MA in parentheses. And then you just clearly wanna write out the um, institute or university's name and the city and country they're located in. If it's outside of the US, again, we recommend a brief description underneath. 
Um, some folks add in the month and year of graduation date. Um, at UPGO, we recommend just adding in the year that you graduated for education. This is, of course, different compared to professional experience where you should have month year or for education, you just simply list um, the year. So you can also add in additional details. For example, if your GPA was 3.5 or um, above 3.5, you can add that in as a bullet point underneath. Um, if you did any type of thesis, whether it was a written thesis or a thesis project, you can also add in a bullet point, um, particularly if it's relevant to the types of jobs you're applying for now. You, you want to add that type of information in as well with a simple bullet point and the title of your thesis. Absolutely. Okay, so now we have your optional professional development section. Um, so this is going to highlight continuing education, right? So this is distinct from your university training. So this is going to be like your certification, seminars, presentations, workshops, stuff like that. Um, I only want you to include this stuff if it's relevant to the position that you're applying for. So don't put an accounting certificate in a software development resume. Uh, we want to make sure also that the certification is credible. So how do we know if it's credible? There's probably more tricks to knowing whether your certification is, is credible. Uh, it, they might come from accredited institutions. Um, you want to look at the backing institution? Is it like Stanford, Penn State? Is it like an established sort of uh, through an established provider like, you know, Salesforce or Google or something like that, right? So you want to make sure it has some cachet. Um, so, you know, as with everything, you just want to make sure that you're spelling this out clearly. You want to make sure that any acronyms are spelled out. You know, some certifications have long acronyms attached to them. Make sure the recruiters, the HR people, they're not always specialists in your field. They might want to verify what this thing is. So make sure you spell it out to them. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think so. When we're talking about certifications in particular, we want to start with the certification name, followed by the certifying body, the date you obtained it, its expiry date, stuff like that. Um, anything to add to this, Layla? I think that's great. Um, and just remember, keep this very, as Tim was saying, you know, clean format. So just very kind of simple. Don't don't add in too much information. Just stick to that format and keep this section neat and clean. Great. So a few tips. If you are ex currently experiencing, you know, some kind of gap, um, unemployment where you have that gap on your resume, we just wanted to address that and give some tips. First one being, be honest about employment dates. Don't change them on LinkedIn or the resume. Uh, professional integrity is just really important. So just be direct and honest about those dates. Um, if you're no longer working in a position, you know, make sure to update your LinkedIn profile with a more basic kind of tagline and put that end date of the position. If you have a large employment lapse, you can go back to your professional summary on your resume and I address it directly there. And some phrasing that you can use as an example is, um, you know, ex-professional with more than a decade of experience and a recent year spent doing whether it's research, continued education, you know, coursework, seeks exposition at a fast growing startup. So that's a way to just directly address a gap in your professional summary. And remember, a gap is not the end of the world. Employers are used to seeing gaps. As long as you're staying relevant, trying to do things in your field, like freelance, um, take courses, you know, in, on Coursera, local community college, whatever it may be, Udemy, there's some great online kind of 
coursework that you can find that really shows to employers, um, it, it really fills that gap and shows them what you've been up to to stay relevant. And take advantage of any downtime you have by doing contract work, volunteer work, or continued education. If you have a large gap between your last employment and the present day, you can put this experience up front in the experience section and you can put a job title to attach to that, um, our own kind of own your contributions. And even if they were unpaid, if you took on some kind of project, if you managed an Airbnb, for example, add that, you know, that in itself can show valuable transferable soft skills. Um, and when they, if a company you're interviewing for asks about compensation, uh, for that type of, you know, experience section, you can say you involved good, it involved goodwill um, or a barter in lieu of payment. Um, there are ways to address it. And Tim will talk more about a possibility of how to phrase this on your resume in a transition period. Uh, but if you have done something like managed an Airbnb, temp work, contract work, you can put that um, on your resume to show what you've been up to. And um, just wanted to end by saying that a lot of companies offer returnships, specific job opportunities open for, for folks who have been out of the workforce for an extended period of time. So if you're interested in those, I recommend, you know, kind of uh, looking up what's called returnships, which is a great way it's designed for folks who've been out of the workforce uh, for a while. That's good to know. Uh, return ships. I didn't know about that. Um, so what is this? The transition period. This is something you're probably not really used to seeing. Uh, this is something that we really recommend to our job seekers that have really long uh, employment gaps or they had complicated immigration situations or maybe they're mothers that are returning to the workforce or something like that. This is just another way to tell recruiters what you've been up to, okay? And you can put this right at the front of your professional experience. Be brave, put it out there. So what you're just gonna do is you're gonna say transition period, indicate the date of time, say, for example, in this case, the job seeker is saying, I relocated to the US and I took a career break to facilitate adjustment very hard for people to argue with that okay uh transition period worked various jobs to maintain my financial security so you're telling the recruiter that you were busy in transitional jobs i was attending classes and completing online certification so what this is indicating to the hiring manager or recruiter is that you were your full-time job was finding a job and training for a job for, you know, for this position, right? So um, I think the biggest takeaway, so we've talked about, we've, we've talked a little bit about the transition period. We've talked about your professional development section. We've talked about an additional experience section. You don't have to leverage all of these different things. You can use them as you see fit in your resume. The important thing as Layla was just discussing is to be really, creative about what it is you're doing right now if you are out of work or if you are underemployed. Be very creative about communicating that to the person who is looking at your resume. What are you communicating? You're communicating that you are still operating in very good faith within your industry and really, really trying to get back into it. Okay, you haven't just left the workforce altogether. Um, so that is that. And here are a few reasons to be hopeful. Um, I, can just, take, I can take this section. Yeah, great, really. go for it. Yeah, no problem. I, I, so I just really, uh, I included this on the, at, at the last minute. Um, so I didn't want me to take you by surprise, Layla. But so what I really wanted to do was, since we're at the end and we're about to take your questions in just a couple of slides, we are in the middle of an economic downturn. Okay, there's no way to sugarcoat it. Um, I want to end this on a message of hope, though, 
companies are still hiring. And I know that you guys are invested in your job search because you're here today. You should keep going. And I know you will, I have faith that you will, but companies are still hiring. How do we know that? Well, we have pretty sophisticated labor market data insights at Upwardly Global. We've worked with partners say, at, at a consulting firm called Accenture as well to look at all of the relevant labor market data. The good news is demand has just shifted for positions, okay? Professional jobs in particular are more secure. So those transitional jobs, the Uber, the Lyft, the restaurant uh, industry jobs, the retail jobs, they've gone away or they've been severely curtailed or impacted as I'm sure many of you know and feel on a very personal level, the professional jobs are more secure. So this is all just to say, I just wanted to end this on a high note, make sure uh, that you don't lose hope, that you don't lose faith, you will get a job. We did a deep dive into our data before the pandemic. Our job seekers were taking six months on average to place in a professional job. After the pandemic, we're only looking at about seven or eight months. So it has not really changed too, too much. It slowed down just a little bit, okay? Uh, and if again, if you know anybody who needs our services, we'll keep them competitive. We'll help them follow the demand, sell themselves, build their connections and skills. That's what we do day in and day out. Uh, and then we can move to the next slide because I think it is something about. Okay, free resources. I already mentioned the public portal. Like this is another great free resource for people who are either immigrants or you're just, you know, any old person who's in the workforce, right? Or in the job search, right? So this is our job versity resource library. So many great things here. I encourage you to take down the web link. You've got information on everything we've been talking about today. You can learn how to do your resume. You can learn how to interview really well. You, we have industry licensing guides, which some people are very interested in. Tons of stuff in there. I can't even name all of it. Be sure to check it out. I think you'll love it a lot. And that's, I think, all we have. Um, if you're at all curious about our program, if you wanna to talk to us, if you wanna ask us any questions whatsoever, Layla and I are very open. Uh, take down our contact information, email us at any time. We're very friendly. Um, and it's been a pleasure presenting to you guys today. And then I guess we can take questions. Looks like the chat. Do we have any 